America Looks Abroad. This is the 40th in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association. Today's subject is America's Choice in Europe. The speaker is Mr. William T. Stone, Vice President and Washington Representative of the Foreign Policy Association. Mr. Stone. Good afternoon. This week, as the Battle of Britain rises to new heights of fury, the United States faces two major issues affecting our relations with Great Britain and our own national defense. These are, first, the proposal to sell or transfer some 50 or 60 overage destroyers to Britain, and second, the opening of direct negotiations with the British government for acquisition of naval and air bases in British possessions in the Western Hemisphere, coupled with simultaneous negotiations with Canada on problems of hemisphere defense. President Roosevelt announced the negotiations with Britain at his press conference on Friday, and then, last night, hurried to the Canadian border for a talk with Prime Minister Mackenzie King. Mr. Roosevelt insists that there is no connection between the proposed destroyer sale and these important diplomatic conversations. Nevertheless, it is inevitable that the two issues should be linked in the public mind, as both involve the paramount question of our relations with the British Empire at a moment when Britain is fighting for her life. As to the destroyers, it is now revealed officially that the possible transfer of these ships was first raised nearly two months ago, sometime in June, when the French armies were retreating before the Nazi war machine. The British purchasing mission in the United States brought the matter to the attention of Mr. Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury, explaining that the British shortage of destroyers was far more serious than is generally realized in this country. Many destroyers were needed in the Mediterranean, a number had been lost, and new vessels under construction would not be ready for several months. These small ships, moreover, would play an important role in the defense of Britain, as they are less vulnerable to air attack than battleships and heavy craft. This early feeler was followed up last week by formal requests through diplomatic channels for the sale or transfer of at least 50 destroyers, or more if possible. The ships are all overage vessels built during the World War and recently reconditioned by the Navy. While President Roosevelt and Navy officials declined to make any public comment, a number of prominent citizens came forward to support the sale, including General Pershing, Admiral Stanley, the former Chief of Naval Operations, and the William Allen White Committee to defend America by aiding the Allies. In Congress, the issue was warmly debated last week with conflicting statements by proponents and critics of the plan. The argument in favor of the move is that in the present state of the world, our own vital interests and our own national defense can best be served by preventing the destruction of the British fleet. Supporters claim that the transfer would not violate international law, that it can be made without action by Congress, and that the destroyers can be spared by the Navy. Opponents contend that the proposed sale would be an act of war, that it would violate domestic and international law and weaken our own navy. Now, in analyzing these conflicting claims, it is necessary to separate the legal question, whether the sale runs counter to domestic and international law, from the larger issue of national interest. On the question of law, there is a difference of opinion among legal authorities but the following facts are generally accepted. First, about two months ago, there was a proposal to release some 20 motor torpedo boats to Britain, boats that were being built in this country for the United States Navy. On June 24th, Attorney General Jackson advised the President that the transfer of these vessels would seem to be prohibited by domestic legislation. The Attorney General cited the Espionage Act of June 15th, 1917, section three of which covers this point. It uh, provides, I quote, during a war in which the United States is a neutral nation, it shall be unlawful to send out of the jurisdiction of the United States any vessel built, armed, or equipped as a vessel of war with any intent or under any agreement or contract that such vessel shall be delivered to a belligerent nation, end quote. This act was in accord with our traditional neutrality policy under international law, which imposes a duty on neutrals to prevent the fitting out or arming of vessels intended to be used by belligerents as men of war. 
There are reports today that the Attorney General may give another opinion on the matter of destroyers, but this has not yet been confirmed. Secondly, in the National Defense Act passed by Congress and signed by the President on July 2nd of this year, the sale or transfer of any vessels, weapons, or munitions to any foreign government is forbidden unless, and the proviso is important, unless the Chief of Naval Operations or the Chief of Staff of the Army certifies that they are not essential to the national defense. Now, it would take much too long to examine all the conflicting legal interpretations of these acts. The essential difference, however, may be stated in simple terms somewhat as follows. Those who believe that the sale is contrary to law insist that the opinion given by the Attorney General in connection with the 20 torpedo boats applies equally to the destroyers on the ground that the vessels would clearly be sent out of the jurisdiction of the United States for use as warships by a belligerent nation. Those who contend that the transaction is legal make a distinction between the torpedo boats, which were under construction in American shipyards, and the old destroyers, which were not originally built or fitted out for a belligerent. The latter, it is said, can be sold to Great Britain, provided that the sale and delivery take place outside the jurisdiction of the United States. Furthermore, they assert that the approval of Congress is not required if the Navy Department certifies that the ships are not essential to the United States. Like most legal arguments, there is plenty of room for difference of opinion. In view of this difference of opinion and the importance of the issue, it would appear to be the wisest course for the administration to seek the approval of Congress. This, however, would admittedly take time, and time is pressing. The real issue, of course, is whether the move would aid our, aid our own national defense and safeguard our national interests. At the present time, the United States has probably the largest destroyer fleet in the world, with a total of some 236 vessels in this category. Of this number, about 76 are new, underage ships, while the remainder, 169, are more than 16 years old. Those which Britain wants today come from a group of more than 100 destroyers built during the World War and recently reconditioned. Some are in, in the neutrality patrol. Some have been converted into fast mine layers and other types of ship. They are all assigned for duty in the Navy. Whether or not they can be spared is in large part a technical question, which should be answered by the Chief of Naval Operations. So far, however, the Navy has made no statement on this point. Whether or not the ships will be essential to the United States will depend almost entirely upon what happens in Europe during the next 90 days. If Britain is able to withstand the Nazi invasion, we will have no immediate need to use them. But if the British Navy is destroyed or falls into the hands of the enemy, we will face a victorious Germany with a fleet superior to ours and shipbuilding facilities far above our present capacity. If the 50 destroyers would turn the balance and prevent a British defeat, our defense would seem to be strengthened far more than it would by holding the ships ourselves. The heart of the question, however, is whether the 50 destroyers will be sufficient to turn the balance. If they are not, the logic which compelled us to take this step forces us to take the next step in the form of any and all measures which may be necessary to prevent the defeat of Great Britain. It should be perfectly clear then that if we are to do anything effective, we must be prepared to go much further than the transfer of a few old ships. It must also be clear that we are making a decision from which there may be no turning back. Most Americans agree that our vital interests would be gravely jeopardized by a Nazi victory in Europe, and a majority of our citizens favor extending all possible aid to Great Britain short of war. But if we accept the conclusion that a Nazi victory would threaten American interests, it does not necessarily follow that our entry into the war would solve all of our problems. For even assuming that we could prevent the invasion of England and eventually defeat Hitler in Europe, we would still face the challenge of revolutionary forces which already extend far beyond the borders of Germany. The negotiations with Great Britain may prove to be of even greater importance in relation to American foreign policy and national defense. 
even though they are not directly linked with the sale of destroyers, they may have the effect of increasing British naval strength in her home waters. For if the talks result in an agreement by which the United States takes over British bases on this side of the Atlantic and assumes full responsibility for meeting any act of aggression in this hemisphere, British and Canadian warships on duty in these waters may be recalled for the defense of the British Isles. From the point of view of our own defense, there can be no question that the strategic value of additional naval and air bases, particularly in the vital area of the Panama Canal. Our principal bases today, outside of the continental United States, are located at Guantanamo, Cuba, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. These form an adequate protective screen to cover the passages into the Caribbean from the North Atlantic. But from the South Atlantic, the approaches to the Panama Canal are exposed all the way down the line of the Lesser Antilles, the Leeward and the Windward Islands, which extend to the coast of South America. A Nazi victory in Europe would place Germany within striking distance of Brazil from bases on the west coast of Africa. In fact, our present base at Puerto Rico is actually some 700 miles further from Natal, Brazil, than Freetown in West Africa or the Cape Verde Islands. As yet, there has been no clear indication as to just what territories may be under discussion or the terms on which the United States might take over British bases. The only naval bases maintained by Britain today in this area are at Bermuda and Jamaica, and both are secondary stations. These are undoubtedly being considered. But the United States is more interested in Trinidad, off the coast of Venezuela, which could be developed as a first-class base to protect the exposed line of the Antilles. Other potential bases are found in the Windward and Leeward Islands and in Newfoundland, which is vital to the security of Canada. The talks with Canada may prove to be just as far-reaching as those with Great Britain. The implications are enormous. They suggest the possibility of a mutual defense pact with our neighbor to the north to be implemented by Army and Navy staff conversations. If such a pact should be concluded, it would be our first alliance since the treaty with France during the Revolutionary War. Staff conversations are likely in any case. These would deal with mutual problems, not only for the defense of Canada, but for all British possessions in the Western Hemisphere. These steps, while unprecedented, are logical extension of American policy. Canada has always been included within the Monroe Doctrine, by implication at least, as it was obvious that our own security would be threatened by any attack on the Dominion. Two years ago, at Kingston, Ontario, President Roosevelt declared that the people of the United States will not stand idly by if the domination of Canadian soil is threatened. And on April 14th last year, he repeated his pledge that this country would join in defending Canada if she were ever attacked from overseas. These pledges are now being carried out. What is happening today reflects the change that would take place in our position should Germany win a complete victory in Europe. If we are taking unprecedented action, we are doing so because we are faced with unprecedented conditions. You have been listening to Mr. William T. Stone, Vice President and Washington Representative of the Foreign Policy Association. America's Choice in Europe was the subject of his talk today. If you would like a free copy of this talk, send your request to the Foreign Policy Association, number 8 West 40th Street, New York City. The Foreign Policy Association, number 8 West 40th Street, New York City. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world events, and in the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the series, America Looks Abroad. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. Mm -hmm.